Thank you, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, ranking members, and members of the committee for inviting me today. Uh, I would like to talk about the nature of the Iranian regime and a sober U.S. strategy to contend with it. I would argue over the last four decades, no government in the world has had a more clear and consistent grand strategy than the Islamic Republic of Iran. And there have essentially been three components to Iran's grand strategy. Number one, they have sought to topple the U.S.-led world order. Number two, they've sought to replace Israel with Palestine. And number three, Iran has sought to remake the Middle East in its image. These aspirations of Iran will continue regardless of whether or not the nuclear deal with Iran is revived. Part of the reason for the consistency of Iran's grand strategy over the last four decades is the fact that Iran has only had two leaders since 1989, Ayatollah Khomeini, the father of the Islamic Revolution. And from 1989 to the present, Iran has been ruled by the current supreme leader, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei. He has not left Iran since 1989. And for Ayatollah Khamenei, uh, the identity of the Islamic Republic is premised on hostility towards the United States. The former president of Iran, Mohammad Khatami, in fact, once told me in a private setting that when he was president, when Mr. Khatami was president, the supreme leader used to tell him that uh, Iran needs enmity with the United States. The revolution needs enmity with the United States. And so for that reason, I think um, from the vantage point of U.S. foreign policy, it's going to be very difficult for us to make any type of amends with the regime which needs us as an adversary for their own internal legitimacy. So what should be a U.S. strategy to contend with the Islamic Republic of Iran? I think there are three components to uh, sober U.S. strategy toward Iran. Number one, we obviously have to contain and counter Iran's nuclear ambitions. Number two, we have to contain and counter Iran's regional ambitions. And number three, which is, I think, very important and often overlooked, it's important for us to champion the democratic aspirations of the Iranian people. We oftentimes overlook this, but I would argue this is uh, central to how the Cold War with the Soviet Union ended. Now, over the last four decades, there's been very few instances in which the Islamic Republic of Iran has compromised, the last being when they signed the JCPOA in 2015. And I would argue the way in which Iran is, the conditions under which Iran is compromised um, has, has only been one formula. And, and, and that is that Iran compromises when it's faced with significant multilateral pressure uh, coupled with direct U.S. engagement and firm U.S. resolve. And number three, in pursuit of a concrete uh, viable outcome. Um, as much as we would like to have maximalist goals vis-a-vis goals -vis Iran to totally eradicate Iran's nuclear program or to totally expunge Iranian influence in the Middle East, these are not viable goals. I think the good news is that Iran is one of the most strategically isolated countries in the world. Its only real ally has been the Assad regime in Syria. I would like to conclude on my final point, which is that the greatest ally that the United States has against uh, the Islamic Republic of Iran are in fact the people of Iran, the vast majority of whom aspire to be like South Korea, not North Korea. The U.S. Uh, policy uh, tools that we've used to prevent Iran from becoming, becoming like North Korea have been political and economic isolation. But I would argue to try to facilitate uh, Iranian society's aspirations of becoming like South Korea, it also requires U.S. Uh, uh, engagement and, and, and integration. And I think the way we thought creatively about how to uh, engage with societies in the Soviet Union, in Russia, in the Eastern Bloc, um, using uh, information, inhibiting those regimes' ability to control information and communication tools, 
uh, I think we need to think much harder about that in the Iranian context. The very final thing I'd like to talk about uh, are, in fact, the hostages. And I thank you, Mr. Chairman, the ranking member, for, for talking about them. One of my close friends of 20 years is Siamak Namazi. He has been held in hostage in Iran almost seven years now. And he believes that his fate, um, he, his freedom is not going to be um, uh, resolved. He's not going to become free uh, absent a U.S.-Iran agreement. And I, and I think we really need to think hard about how to uh, separate the issue of the JCPOA and the issue of freeing American hostages in Iran. And I think we need to think very hard with our like-minded allies about how to uh, deter and penalize this odious, odious Iranian practice of hostage-taking. Thank you very much.